Um, hi everyone, As, thanks Antonio. I'm actually standing in for a speaker this month, so we look forward to rescheduling Beth Anderson's talk some time during the summertime. Uh, so you'll have to put up with me today, and what I'm going to talk to you today about though is Go Please and Vim, which is an editor for those people who don't know, uh, resulting in something called Go Vim. And Go Vim is a Go development plugin for Vim 8. So that Let's kick off. So we're going to cover a bit of editor history, first of all. Everyone loves talking about their favorite editor and why it's their favorite editor and why every, edi uh, every other editor is the worst. So we'll just cover a bit of that background. Um, we're going to talk a bit about Go, please. Uh, Go is new language server. What is a language server? Why do we need one? Uh, then we're going to talk a bit about Go Vim. So if you use Vim as an editor or are thinking about it, why Go Vim might be an interesting thing. Um, and then we're going to have some demos at the end as well to keep it interesting. Okay, so in 20, every year there is a Go user survey. And the Go user survey seeks to sort of ask questions about the community of why they like Go, why they don't like Go, what's missing, etc. And a key question in that, and perhaps one of the most hotly contested questions is preferred editor. And everyone looks at these to sort of think, am I using the best editor? Am I using the cool editor? And sadly, I'm using an editor that is in decline, as you can see. So Vim there is now down at 17%. But there was a really good talk, actually, by Bram Mullenar, who actually created Vim, uh, where he said, well, it doesn't really matter what editor you use, just as long as it enables you to be productive in what it is you're trying to do. Now, yes, there might be more productive ways, and guess what? We're always learning more productive ways of doing things, whether that's in our editor or not. So really, the, the, the hype around editor chats is sort of a bit overhyped, if you like. So just stick to what you have right now, and always sort of keep an open mind on what it is you're learning. But as you can see here, Visual Studio Code and Goland have so there have been great strides over the last couple of years in terms of the percentage users using them. And so why is that? Well, they've got lots of features integrated into them that people need and use the whole, ti whole time, whether that be formatting, completion, whatever it might be. But there's a sort of general feeling that actually they provide a bit of a better user experience. So let's just do a bit of a history lesson here. In the beginning, there were just editors and text edit for anyone who might have used it, it's probably the text editor um, that most people will have heard of. It is just a text editor. That's it. You can type, save, create new files. That's about it. Then as other editors have come along, you've been able to do more things like search and replace. So, so the functionality of an editor has actually grown. But there are only certain things that an editor can do that is not specific to a language, i.e. to keep generic across all languages. So then some tools came along. Now, you might recognize a number of these tools down the right-hand side. And let's now focus on Go code. So Go Fumpt for formatting your code so that it looks consistent, so that anyone who's reading your code doesn't have to scan too hard at the code they're looking at. Go Code for completion. Everybody, most people in here, if they've written any Go code, will probably think something like Go Code or an equivalent completer to help them write code. Go imports for adding those pesky missing import statements when you've written fump.println, for example. You don't want to have, these things are just automating your editor experience and making your life writing Go code easier. Go lint, sort of a, an opinionated way in which to name variables and various other rules. Static check, checking that you're not making sort of classic mistakes in the use of, for example, net HTTP, whatever it might be. So all of these things, the editors by themselves weren't quite enough. And so people started bolting bits onto the side and then telling the editors, oh, you better call out to this tool in order to run this check here or to format this code. So you can sort of see this starts to get a tiny bit messy, though, because you've got all these editors, all of these tools with no standard way of one, effectively one side talking to the other side. So it's unsurprising that actually, when there's forks as well, if you think Go code has three different forks, which forks should you use? You've got to install it yourself. So the story gets a bit trying, really. From the tool writer's perspective, from the editor's write, plugin writer's perspective, but also critically from the user's perspective. So that's kind of what I'm summarizing here. There are so many problems with this approach here. There's a large e overhead from the plugin editor developer's perspective. It's inconsistent from the user's perspective. That's critical, right? If you want to switch from using VS Code to Golan, for example, you're getting a different experience in terms of what functionality you have available to yourself. There's a problem of continuity as well, as we've seen this different forks of different tools. 
you know, somebody says, well, I can't maintain this any longer, so somebody creates another fork, which means you have to install the tool from another place, and so on and so on. And on top of this, the critical point is that if we just go back two slides here, is that with a lot of these tools, they end up doing each tool doing the same work over and over again. So if, they need to, if a tool needs to parse your code in order to work out what it should do, well, guess what? Every single tool is probably going to have to do that as well. So you might have it reparsing the same file many, many times over, on a, even on a key press, for example. And that starts to get very expensive. So this is where something called Go Please comes in. It's the new language server protocol server for Go. And it's largely written by Rebecca Stambler and the Go Tools team based in New York. And the idea is that you simplify this whole diagram here, where you've got many editors and many tools, by effectively just having one tool that the editor talks to and defining a protocol slash in a specification that the editor speaks to this tool with and vice versa. So these two can communicate about what the other can do and what, what it can't do. Now, this has a huge number of benefits. You'll notice there's no tools actually on this diagram at all here. So from the editor's perspective, you don't even know that this functionality sort of is there because it's sort of hidden behind this one tool that is now called Go Please. And it also makes it much simpler from the editor, right, it, it, the editor plugin perspective as well because actually they're only needing to talk to one tool now, not literally 20, 30 tools. So there's a much better coordination of development effort going on here as well. So if you think about, maybe you've bemoaned the fact that, oh, my editor doesn't have this functionality that is in Goland, for example, or Goland is missing something that is in Visual Studio Code, for example. This whole world starts to get a bit more even. The playing field is a bit more even now because you just have this one tool. Now, Goland, I'm going to talk about somewhat separately here because it's not using Go Please at the moment, but all these other editors do. Whether Goland does or doesn't, neither here nor there, really. Um, so the, the, the playing field is much more level in terms of what each editor can do, and therefore the user experience, critically, is much more consistent. Now, editors work in very, very different ways, so it's not like you click on the same button in Visual Studio Code or in, Go, uh, or in Vim, for example. Conceptually, though, what I can do with my Go code is the same between them. And above all, it's massively fast and efficient, because guess what, you don't have 10 different tools Often those tools are running on demand as well. You have this one tool, Go Please, running the whole time. So it is fast and it is caching absolutely everything that you're doing in whatever code you're editing at a time. So this is where GoVim comes in, which is, a, is, is effectively a hobby project of mine. Um, it's a plugin for Vim, which, as I said, is an editor. And this plugin itself is backed by GoPlease. So the idea is that I want to bring to Vim the kind of rich experience that exists in things like Visual Studio Code. And I'm going to do that by using the new language server, GoPlease. So I'm not going to have to interface with lots and lots of different tools. I'm just going to interface with one. And that's going to be GoPlease. Now, if anybody here uses Vim as an editor, you will have heard of the plugin Vim Go. Hugely popular and extremely well-written plugin. Now, my plugin is an experiment, if you like, and it's unlike Vim Go in that my plugin is written in Go as opposed to the native plugin language for Vim, which is Vim Script. So it has many of the same features as Vim Go and, and Visual Studio Code. Hover with the mouse, or when you hover over something, it shows you a nice little signature or type information about the thing you're hovering over. Format on save, code completion. No real surprises here, because these are the kinds of things that we've come to expect from our editor. Um, what status is it? It's an alpha status, i.e. fairly early, probably going to break. But I'm using it 100% of the time. And if anybody here uses Vim and fancies giving it a shot, contributing, that would be much appreciated. Um, but the main question is, if, if you do use Vim here, you're probably asking yourself, well, what is wrong with Vim Go? It's got, I think, over, I'm going to misquote it here, but let me just guess at over 10,000 stars on GitHub. It's hugely well known. As you saw, 17% of the Go community, roughly, are actually using Vim, and they're most likely all of them using Vim Go. So what's wrong with it? Well, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Uh, Fatih and Billy have done, and all the, the folks who've worked on Vimgo have done a, a fantastic job at maintaining it. 
because it, Vim Go came about before Go Please. So it predates a lot of these tools even. So it's had to move with the times and has a lot of history before that. So in order to sort of deal with that moving landscape, they've had quite a job on their hands and they've done a fantastic job. As I said, Go Vim, however, my plugin is an experiment. It's an experiment that, writing, that tests the hypothesis that writing Vim plugins in Go instead of Vim script will make for much more readable and maintainable code and it will allow more people to contribute. Because quite frankly, one of the reasons I haven't been able to contribute to Vim Go is that I'm just not good enough at Vim script. I, it's just too complicated a language for my small brain. So I thought instead, I'll write the plugin in Go and that will allow more people to actually contribute and to make my life easier. So I have to do this. There's a link to the FAQ there that goes into a bit more detail on this question, because it's critical. There's absolutely nothing wrong with Vim Go. This is just an experiment, but a fun one at the same time. So as I said, it's going to be backed by Go, please. Uh, and so what upcoming features are there going to be in Go Vim? Well, it kind of depends what goes into Go, please next. And by extension, because that's also written in Go, it'll be much easier to contribute to the two effectively in parallel. Anything else you'd like to see? Please then raise an issue. Um, if anyone wants to give it a try, please do. Any feedback, issues, PRs, very gratefully received. Um, a few thanks very quickly. Um, Fatih and Billy, as I said, for VimGo, uh, sort of everything that we do in Vim is kind of built on that. Uh, Rebecca and the Golang Tools team uh, in the States, um, fantastic in, in all the work in, that they've done for Go, please, and all the supporting packages. And as Antonio mentioned as well, if anyone's interested in writing tools in Go to support the development of Go, whatever, um, the Golang Tools community is a fantastic place for sort of meeting like-minded folks. We have a, a call every month, um, which is hosted on Google Hangouts. Lots of interesting chat in that if tooling is your, is your thing. So now let's try and do a bit of a demo, which will likely go wrong, but let's see. Uh, so this is uh, Vim. It's not as exciting as Apu's uh, GoLand that he had going on earlier on. Um, very, very simplistic. It doesn't have a lot of user interface. I'm actually using the, 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 the GUI version of Vim here. There is a terminal version, which is even more plain and simple, but we won't go there today. So let's just actually open up um, some of the code that is behind uh, GoVim itself. And so some of the features that you can see here, hopefully you can see that little balloon that's popped up there. The hover feature here, just giving me information where with my mouse I hover over, it's telling me what the signature of that function is. I mean, then I actually want to click through to that function. I'm clicking with the mouse here to actually jump to that definition. Now the key thing here is that all of this is happening in the background via Go Please, the language server, and it's extremely fast. I could have a massive project open here. And whereas before, the editor would actually do this on demand, it would call out to a tool and it would say, oh, hang on, let me just load the code, work out where it is you want to go. This is all cached and happening sort of from a hot load in the background already. So moving around in, um, uh, with uh, GoVim is significantly quicker. You can see I'm literally just jumping between all the code here. Uh, code completion, absolutely. So you can see here I'm just typing away. Um, let me just put in a message. Hello, London Gophers. Let, actually, let me just make, deliberately make a mistake here because I've added a verb in here to my fump.printf. And the thing you can also do as well is the, the Go Please language server is giving you diagnostic information as well about any problems in your code. So I've just opened what's called the quick fix window here. And it's telling me your printer format reads one arg but is called with zero arguments. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, I didn't include that. But when I actually fix it, you can see the error disappears in the quick fix window below. Now for anyone who uses Visual Studio Code or Goland, you might be thinking, wow, big deal. I get this for free the whole time. Thanks for coming, Paul. Um, the thing is in Vim, this, this is kind of what I, where I'm coming from, is that this sort of experience, this IDE-like experience has been somewhat lacking from Vim. Now, Vim Go goes, as I said, that's the, the sort of the incumbent plugin, if you like, goes a long way towards supporting that. But the, I, the idea that I'm trying to test is that actually writing such a plugin in Go is much easier, and you can do, lots of people can help contribute to sort of adding these sorts of functions and this sort of functionality as well. Um, so format on save, I'm just deliberately going to add in some blank lines there and then save the file. You can see it's just formatted it. Let's just delete and import. 
There we go. Nothing particularly exciting here. This is to actually just show that my code does roughly work. Um, as I said, I'm using it 100% of the time. Um, would appreciate anybody who has any feedback or contributions to this. Um, but otherwise, please come, oh, I think I've run over a bit here. Please come and grab me at the break and happily chat about it more.